welcome to a special presentation of the Wikibon Whiteboard. We're here at the Dell EMC Executive Briefing Center. Happy to have with me a uh, guy I've known for many years. We've done a ton of videos. Chad Sackett, it's been too we're, we're, we're getting older, dude. Yeah, um, yeah we, we keep getting older, but uh, yeah, something, something. <laughs> and, and titles are irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, great. Well, Chad, and great point. Uh, what I'm excited to be able to do is kind of, you know, take off the jacket, yeah. have a little bit more of a fun interaction. What you and I love to do is, well, let's talk about technology. Let's talk about some of the trends that are going on in the space. Harkens back to uh, both you and I back <laughs> back when I was at EMC. Uh, we did had done some whiteboard videos uh, back then, almost a decade ago. It was the storage protocols. Uh, you know, you, you did a great series talking about VMware and the choices customers were making back then. Yep. NFS, iSCSI, and Fiber Channel. Uh, I did one introducing Fiber Channel over Ethernet as the new uh, potential channel then. And I mean, tens of thousands of people watched these videos, which in our, in our little neck of the woods uh, was, was pretty exciting. I, I, uh, I can't believe two things. Number one, that anyone would ever get into a passionate bar fight over iSCSI, Fiber Channel, or NFS, but people really did. Uh, and in fact, even on this weekend on Twitter, there were some people who were arguing jump the classic jumbo frames versus no jumbo frames argument. But uh, Stu, you and I are the whiteboard kings. Absolutely. Look at this. So yeah, up. Oh, you got the markers already. So uh, Chad, you know, as we talk about it, 2017 now. Yeah. So hard to believe. So much has changed in the industry. Uh, I'm not having discussions about storage protocols anymore. Yeah, it's been many years. Uh, you know, your, your group, of course, has done kind of converged infrastructure, mm -hmm. which I think was one of the main drivers to get rid of it. I mean, I remember one of the yep. first customers I talked to that had a broad deployment of fiber channel over Ethernet, it was a NetApp customer. It wasn't file, it was just like, oh, that's what you're using? And he's like, that's what the solution I had, used. I, I didn't had care. Ethernet, so yeah. I just wanted to use it. Now, th the thing that I, I'd say, though, is, is that while protocols, frankly, weren't that relevant then and aren't that relevant now, um, there still is a lot of debate over uh, what's going on in the world of persistence. I always use the word persistence as opposed to storage yeah. because storage makes humans visualize storage arrays. Yeah. And often I get asked, uh, we're here at the briefing center, literally I just talked to a, a giant customer that said, is there any, what's, what's the future of these things? Are they, are they dinosaurs? Are we going to keep using them? Or what's going on? Or is everything going to move to cloud storage? Uh, so there's, there's still an architectural discussion over what, what's the future of persistence. And I think the reason that that's important is anyone who's watching who's had a bad storage day, and I'm sure uh, people are watching have, you know that when information goes bye-bye, um, it's bad. Yeah. It's really bad because uh, it's the one part of the compute network and persistence pyramid where the information, is, once it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. So it, it's important to get right. Uh, yeah. Now the question is, what does right mean? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I remember you know working here at EMC. The four-letter word that you never wanted to hear was DUDL, yeah. <laughs> data unavailability or data loss. That was unacceptable. Um, and right, when I look at hybrid clouds, kind of one of the yeah. big discussions we're having in the industry these days. Two things I say is you need to follow your applications and follow your data, and that's going to help you drive those decisions as to what you're doing uh, and what underlying choices you're going to make. So let me let me answer the question here really specifically, and I get I'm, I want to look right at the camera. Is that cool? I'm not trying to ignore. Go, go ahead, Chad. <laughs> so the first thing I want to highlight is that the mistake is to think about this being an answer where it's all one thing or the other. But I want to make a binary statement that's pretty black and white. Our point of view, um, and here this is not just Dell EMC, it's also Dell Technologies, it's also VMware's point of view, is that software-defined storage stacks are ready for the majority of x86 workloads by count. Now, if you unpack that statement, it means a lot, right? Um, so first things first is the leader in the external storage array business. That's a pretty bold statement, sure, right? Uh, but if you unpack it, the first thing is, is that not all SDSs are the same. So you have some that are transactional, you have some that are unstructured, uh, you know, data optimized, you have some that are geo-distributed object stores, those are all different forms of SDSs. And then notice how I said, ready for the majority of x86 workloads by count. Yeah. So, you know, if you look at the workloads that are out there, we still have unbelievable workload diversity, yeah. right? And uh, you find some workloads that require specific functionality in one domain or another, uh, specific performance in one domain or another. And uh, while a two-axis chart is probably uh, 
over trivializing this. Uh, it's a good it's a good place to start. All right, so so let's start there, Chad. Yep. So if I say kind of oversimplifying once again, you know, traditional storage arrays and the storage industry, which is changing greatly, yep. especially I, I think everybody understands with the Dell EMC kind of merger acquisition there. Storage industry is going through a lot of changes, no and, 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 and therefore there. But if I look at how storage has traditionally been bought, it was bought as storage arrays, and it tended to be higher performance had higher functionality, lower performance had lower functionality. You had kind of SMB mid-range and large. This was, you know, kind of you know your, your you know you know you know you know your traditional storage box. Yep. And there were many pieces in there. So you know, criticism of BMC would be like, oh well, you've got four different boxes that make yep. this up. Whether it's you know, your scale out NAS or your mid range or your tier one or things like that. And today, you know, Chad, where do the, the discussions of all flash arrays, you know, hyper converged infrastructure, you know, cloud storage fit into this? Where do they start so, eating away traditional storage? So the, the first thing that I'd say is, is that the biggest thing going on, where is the bulk of the information going yep. these days? It's not in things that people would think of as storage at all, which is really cloud storage. There's a big giant blob here, cloud storage. And what do we mean when we say cloud storage? Well, we mean object stores, they're geo-distributed. It's actually not necessarily germane whether it's on-premises or off-premises, but it's basically something, it's storage that you access via an API, right? right? Uh, you, you know, you open a, a session, it's a RESTful API from the device, and you say, I'm gonna put something or I'm gonna get something in or out. This is the single largest consumer of data uh, that exists out there. Now, its, it's performance criteria is, by transactional storage levels, very low. Um, its aggregate functionality is enormous, right? So uh, some of our largest customers have got geo-distributed object stores that are measured in exabytes of size. Right. But they don't want it, they don't care about things like, um, you know, remote replication in the traditional sense. They care about geo distribution of buckets and objects. They care about uh, encryption and replicas, but not a traditional snapshot. Yeah, and, and there's some really interesting use cases, uh, you know, talking about that. Uh, at, uh, I was at the Amazon reInvent show yep. uh, towards the end of 2016, and lots of people, companies that were built to do analytics on kind of the data lakes, yep. we're seeing more and more that those are happening in clouds, and a lot of that in public clouds, but of course still many going on, you know, hosted, private, you know, whatever you want to call those clouds, yep. so that's doing there, and even talk about the fragmentation, big discussion by some of the people looking forward as to what's this whole sensor IoT wave going to do because when you talk about just the sheer number of nodes, it's going to be at the edge and therefore it's not going to be at some core, you know, public cloud. So storage keeps changing. And it keeps changing and adapting. I, I would argue my own personal opinion that the IoT thing is going to have a combination of edge, aggregation, and core and cloud storage models will be one or the other. I think, you know, people always want to turn these debates into one thing or the other, and the answer is usually a bit more complex. Yeah. Now, the other thing that is fascinating is we're seeing a resurgent, resurgence of plain old DADs, uh, basically disks that are attached to a host that have no magic secret sauce on them at the storage layer whatsoever at that layer, but then the layer up, there's a lot of magic. So, uh, are you saying that that's hyper-converged infrastructure, or you, nope. you're separating that out? What I'm pointing out is, is that there's certain use cases where the customers are basically saying, uh, I am going to build in the intelligence into the application layer. Yep. Yep. So, for example, uh, you know, the, when you and I first started to work together, man, the amount of customers that would deploy Exchange servers on SANS yep. uh, was enormous. It was the dominant way that you would do it, the only way that you could deploy a, a classic, you know, Microsoft cluster, right? right? Uh, maybe not the easiest thing in the world, but that's how people did it. If you look at the last few years, the majority of how Microsoft has been deployed is basically Exchange, Exchange DAG, right? So their own distributed availability groups where they're layering on top of just disks inside the server, right? Now, I, no one in their right mind would call that a hyper-converged thing, right? But basically the, the intelligence is being done higher up inside the application stack. Uh, another example of that is, are obviously customers that uh, deploy uh, Hadoop clusters using HDFS, uh, you know, as the SDS, right. right? 
on top of these, uh, you know, simple DAS models. Now, yeah. it, does that lead into why we're seeing some of, some of these bare metal offerings to be able to put some of those solutions into, you know, a rack space or a public cloud? Yeah, and, and to be able to manage those low-level bare metal things at higher, uh, higher scale means you have to have scalable management models, telemetry, fault, all that sort of jazz, right? Lots of stuff going on there, and a place where we're putting a lot of R&D into VX Rack and other things, right? Now, this space here, it, you know, is, is interesting, but then there's, there's another thing going on, which is hot, 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 and everybody's talking about it, which is basically everything that's going on in the all-flash array space, right? right? Um, you know, the traditional, traditional storage, your blue circle is kind of shrinking, uh, that market is under compression, but there's parts of that market that are booming, like the all-flash array market is a booming market. Um, it is generally something that customers select because they like low latency, so it's higher in performance than the hybrids, certainly. Um, but the bigger issue, the bigger driver is very simple performance. So performance that doesn't require uh, tiering, doesn't require caching mechanisms. It's basically... Uh, I did a blog post on this where I said it's like the IQ test, right. right? You know, if something is faster, simpler, easier, easier, and less expensive, why wouldn't you do it? A absolutely. And what we've seen at Wikibon, while the price of flash, you know, compared to disk has come down, when you talk about some of the, uh, you know, things like compression and dedupe and everything else like that, th the price gets close enough that say service providers or certain large companies often will say the operational simplicity of just deploying yep. all flash is enough to make up for any economical difference and therefore we're going to go all flash whether that's an AFA architecture or buying some other box uh, and just putting in all flash and just getting and disks out of the environment. And we'll get to that one in a second yeah. which is kind of like what's going on around the SDS space, yeah. right? But there's another, there's another interesting one up here which is a le weird little like bloop, you know, which is, which is PCIe... And, and that's NVMe for those that can't read at, at this distance. Yeah, so non-volatile memory uh, of all sorts of types. Uh, lots of interesting stuff going on. You know, 2017 will be the first time that Intel Optane and, and Crosspoint, you know, start to arrive in the market. Right, and, and for people that haven't looked at it, this means that we're getting really close to the compute. It's the compute and the memory storage layer uh, is kind of blurring, and rather than having some external box, this is something that's real close, and we're going to have NVMe-F or NVMe-F, I think they call it, is so the fabric versions of right, that, yes. uh, which is kind of new versions of, uh, yeah, so of, of networking storage. Non-volatile memory types, you know, exist in all forms. So the first example that you point out is basically where you're directly attaching it to the local PCIe bus of the host, right? Um, It'll actually show up in two forms, one of which will be, you know, a, a, a disk device, not a disk device, but a persistence device. Right. The other one that will be interesting this year will where, where it'll show up and it'll interface via memory semantics. Right. So it'll look like a DIM, right? But it'll be a DIM that even if you shut off the power, the data still stays persistent. So it'll take a little yeah, while and, for and, that. And hence why you're saying persistence rather than storage, because right. our previous definitions of memory and storage are starting to blur. They're becoming very blurred, <laughs> yeah. right? So, um, and then there is an NVMe OF, right. so NVMe over a fabric, right. uh, which is a standard uh, that is emergent. Uh, Dell, uh, Dell Technologies, Dell EMC is playing a big part of that along with Intel and with others. Um, you know, we think that it's gonna be, it's interesting, will the fabric emerge? We're not quite sure. Just to, to, you know, and again, anyone who thinks that, you know, your vendor ecosystem, your partners have got all of this stuff all figured out, that's not how it works. If you invest in multiple areas and you see how things go. So obviously, when you've got uh, non-volatile memory, attaching it, because it's so low latency, it's so high performance, attaching it directly to the host, bring it directly adjacent to compute makes a lot of sense. But then at the same time, it's a bit of an esoteric, high-end, expensive thing, and pooling and aggregating things that are expensive also makes sense. Yeah, the only thing I'd say, at least we have in some of the early deployments, 
functionality might be a little bit less than some of these boxes, but right, it's super high performance, kind of a, a niche inside this market, and a smaller, as we always say, kind of that, that tip of the pyramid where yep. some of these really, really big companies are doing it. As you said, Intel yourselves and others are doing it. Uh, I know Wikibon CTO David Floyer, yep. when he's looked at the options out there, that NVMe, NVMe over Fabric, he's quite bullish on it. So, so. so yeah, and, and, and in terms of the feature set, the all-flash arrays, whether it's rich remote replication, whether it's deduplication, compression, uh, unbelievable snapshot capabilities. At this point, for the most part, they match the traditional storage, you know, circle in this weird Venn diagram, um, you know, covering the, the functionality, but always in this higher end of the performance band. Now, the part of this world that I find personally the most interesting right. is, I wish I had a different color. Let me, let me grab one. The blue? Uh, you know what, I'm going to grab a green. Go ahead. Uh, so there's a circle which is surprisingly broad. I know this is a little bit different than your guys' point of view of this circle. Well, if you're looking at the diagram we drew three years ago. <laughs> this is the, the world of software-defined storage right. models. And software-defined storage models comes in multiple different ways of consuming it. Right? There's just getting it as software. So here's the bits. Deploy them on whatever you want, including things that use NVMe inside hosts, and it turns it into some sort of form of shared storage. Right? There's another one, which are server SANs. Server SAN. Yeah, or HCI. And, and then the third version is really this HCI version. Yeah. That I think that there's a difference between these two. And, and there are, and that's why when we created the server SAN, we're kind of blurring the lines between these. What the, the, the big piece is, a software-only SDS could be only storage. Yes. Server SAN, we've tried to say, really, it's compute and storage yep. together, which things like up here, that could fall under. David Floyer yep. did one, he called it Flash's memory extension. Versus HCI, a lot of people thought, oh, it's just an appliance, it's a box, and we were trying to go beyond yeah. that. So the thing that's fascinating is, is the, the, this market is much smaller than the all-flash market. So if the traditional storage market is, let's call it $7 billion, billion dollars, you know, the all-flash array market these days would probably, I'm saying this off the top of my head, I'd say it's probably, what, a $7 billion market? Sounds about right. Rapidly growing, so it's cannibalizing a lot of the hybrids that are out there. This SDS market in all three of these forms is still much smaller than that. But remember my first comment, which is that our belief is that today, SDS models, regardless of which one of these forms of packaging that you use it in, can support the majority of workloads today, whether it's in this performance dimension or whether it's inside this functionality dimension. Yeah, and, and when you say much smaller, it's about half the size. It's not like an yeah. tenth of the size of it. Converged infrastructure is bigger than ASAs. Yeah. That HCI, everything else like that, so it's in the few billion yeah, dollars, yeah. but it's not, you know, five to ten. So, so the thing that's fascinating is the reason that customers go this software-defined storage route, at least in my experience, the biggest single reason is it's simpler and easier for them to deploy, scale, life cycle, manage, migrate. Right. And not a little bit easier, a lot, right? Um, the second reason is, is that fundamentally the, the scaling model is so simple. So again, whether it's software only or service and HCI model where you're getting the, the components together, you know, literally the, the process of uh, expansion is not I'm going to add something new. I'm going to need to figure out how to integrate it. It's attached well, yeah. and grow. It, it's the, the line I heard once is the first time you deploy this is the last time you need to do a migration. Yep. Because as anybody that's been in the storage industry knows, it's that migration time, yep. cost, effort is so difficult. Now, people then ask, well, Chad, if you're saying this so emphatically, uh, then does that mean that there's no room for CI or traditional array architectures? And the answer is, well, first things first, even if today, right today, all workloads could run on it, it would take time for customers and industry to shift and to move. Right. Uh, we think that we have a responsibility actually to push the industry to, to, to go and say, you can move forward with confidence. This is no longer, you know, something weird or esoteric. This is something that we as a, one of the leaders, uh, uh, in this space, we're saying it, it's time to it's time to move. 
Now, there's a subset of this blue circle of functionality that the SDSs don't have. So people are like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, if you came to me and you said I have a workload that needs to have 10,000 synchronous replicas, um, and you need to be able to do a failover or have a three-site failover behavior and be able to do uh, a failover in a fraction of a second. Um, my comment would be, one, you should try to build that sort of availability in your application, not your infrastructure. And then the customer would go, yeah, I don't have that choice because this is an application that's been developed over the last 10, 15 years and there's no way I can re-architect the app. That's the domain of basically all flash arrays or the top part of this traditional storage where things like SRDF and very, very uh, mature replication technologies rule the day. Yeah, and to talk a little bit more about from the application side, you know, most applications that I could run in traditional storage can run on the new ones. What about new new applications? How are how are these options, you know, geared for it, those those new applications? You know, what you see basically is that for any new application, it gears towards this cloud storage or HDFS type storage models, this or this, right? Um, because you want something that's as simple as possible and. You know, if anybody is running a new application, they're building resilience into the application layer of the stack as opposed to inside the infrastructure part of the stack. Again, it may sound like heresy coming from somebody who, you know, has been a long time proud EMC -er and now a Dell EMC employee, but the reality of it is, is that we're not hung up on it. We have the strongest software defined storage stacks in vSAN and Scale.io. We have uh, uh, the strongest cloud storage stacks. ECS is really an SDS. You can see they kind of overlap. We've got the strongest portfolio for customers that are going to deploy things on DAS using PowerEdge, so Dell EMC PowerEdge. We have the strongest all flash arrays and VMAX all flash, Extreme IO. Again, I'm, this isn't intended to be a commercial, right? But the point is, is that the reason that we have this variability is, is because customers are all a little bit different. Yeah, and I mean, you, you throw in here in 2017, you're going to have the Azure Stack solutions yep. that I know you're going to support uh, from the Dell family. We've got VMware on AWS fitting into this mix. So um, the picture seems to only get a little bit more complicated. So I, I guess as we wrap, Chad, you know, what, what's what's the kind of, you know, high-level advice, you know, you and your team giving to CIOs? How do they help I, make this decision other than, you know, come buy it from you? I, um, well, uh, so... <laughs> That's actually a good idea. <laughs> so in all, in all seriousness, what I would say is to any CIO who's worried about this stuff, they've, they're, they've, they've got to look in a slightly different place. Yeah. We live in an interesting geopolitical world right now. Yeah. Um, they've got to be thinking about their own businesses. Um, the reality of it is that there's tumultuous change that's occurring inside the industry. I think that, uh, frankly, my, my request to any viewer, to anyone that I would interact with is, start to become pretty binary about what you do that uniquely innovates for you and what stuff you should frankly just consume, whether it's on-premises or off-premises. If you want to deploy VMware on-prem on HCI, we could deploy that in a simple and easy turnkey way. If you want to deploy it in AWS, we can do that too. You want to have an on-prem Azure stack? Great, we got your back. You want to deploy it in top, inside Azure and you want to put Cloud Foundry on top of that to simplify it further? We got your back. The, the, the point is that this rate of innovation is something that we need to drive so that, frankly, customers shouldn't really care, right? And, uh, you know, that's a primary focus for us. Make things simple. All right. Well, Chad, really appreciate you taking off the jacket, pulling out the marker, sharing <laughs> with our audience, uh, you know, the, the rate of change that's going on and lots more we expect to see through 2017. So thank you so much and look forward to seeing you at many industry events throughout the year. Thanks for watching the Thanks, everybody.